Okay, class, so uh, this we're going to call lesson 15, which will be lecture 12B of the PowerPoint slides, which will be um, on DNA sequencing um, and massive parallel sequencing. So <clears throat> you, you may have or may have not sent off a, a DNA sample to something like 23andMe or Ancestry or something like that. And if you've done that, then what the process they use are, is called SNP detection uh, using a microarray. So they're not actually sequencing your DNA. They're only looking for areas that vary normally in a human population. So uh, if you had a change in your DNA that's not uh, polymorphism in the human population like we talked about, then it, these SNPs uh, array uh, chips are not going to detect that. They're only looking for highly variable regions in humans. So basically what they do is they're going to make probes. So remember what we talked about probes are being uh, small pieces of DNA that you can synthesize, and I've shown you how to make those. Uh, you can order them. If you had a DNA synthesizer, you could do it yourself. Uh, any good organic chemist could do this. But anyway, you're going you're gonna to synthesize these short pieces of DNA. We call them probes. Um, and then you're going to print them onto a, a slide or a chip. So there's lots of ways to print this. You can mechanically print it. I've printed microarrays at the, the Genome Institute of Singapore, at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, they print them at TGen. Uh, but there are other companies that actually do this process too. And Illumina um, uses a process called photomasking, which basically allows them to synthesize DNA strands directly on the chip uh, in a similar way that Intel uses photo masking to mark out all of the different pathways uh, for the, the transistors on their chips. So anyway, um, no matter how they're put on there, you're going to have these short pieces of DNA that are going to be, there's going to be hundreds of thousands, if not millions, on a single spot on this chip. And for, say, an Illumina chip for a human being, there's probably a million different single nucleotide polymorphisms or changes. So there'll be a million spots on these chips, um, all with different uh, fragments of DNA. And so when you swab your mouth and send off the, you close the cap and it, it uh, puts it in a buffer. <clears throat> so that, that buffer inhibits... I mean, if you remember this from Bio 181, DNA in the presence of water is going to break down. It's called hydrolysis. It's a super uh, common reaction in macromolecules in biology. DNA is a macromolecule, just like proteins and fats and uh, carbs. All of those are macromolecules in biological uh, sciences. And so since DNA is like that, it's victim to hydrolysis. Enzymes hydrolyze DNA, they're called DNases, but water hydrolyzes DNA, it's just a lot shorter because enzymes speed up reactions, they don't change the delta G. So with that said, um, these fragments of DNA are printed on this chip. Uh, you, we cleave these fragments, well, when you swab it and you close the lid and it releases that uh, enzyme inhibitor, which basically binds magnesium, it's called uh, EDTH, which stands for ethylene diamine tetracetic acid. And so that inhibits DNAs so that your DNA doesn't get chopped up when you send it in the mail. So you send it off to them and whenever they get it, they're going to cut the pieces of DNA. They can cut those fragments using RFLPs or different ways that we've already talked about. Um, usually they just use sound waves. That's the easiest way to chop DNA into little pieces, and we call it sonication. Um, and then they're going to put all of your pieces of DNA. Generally, they're after they copy it, or or hopefully they have enough. Uh, when they sonicate this, they're going to chop it all up. They're going to put it over their chip, 
and then they're going to add a polymerase. So remember, polymerases, all they need is double-stranded DNA and a free three prime hydroxyl group. They could care less what it is, and they're going to build uh, a complementary strand. So that polymerase is going to do that. And this is an Illumina SNP chip. This one has seven hundred thirteen thousand dollar thousand spots on it. Uh, it doesn't cost seven hundred thirteen thousand um, dollars. These places like uh, Twenty Three and Me and uh, Ancestry buy these chips in bulk. They probably get them for you know twenty dollars a piece, maybe ten. Um, so anyway, they're gonna chop, chop up your DNA. All of these spots are created by photo masking. And this is what the chip looks like if you were to shrink yourself down on it. So every one of these spots, there are, you know, ten, hundreds of thousands of these spots, if not millions of these spots. And on the end, so let's say there's a G uh, or an A uh, or a C or a T. So in one person, uh, we may have uh, a T and another person that may be a C. And so um, if, if a T gets incorporated on the end, we can see the illumination of the light. And so this spot would be recorded. We know that there's an A on the end of that, right? And so maybe this is a G and this is a C and this is a T. And so we know by looking at this chip that this person has T because it's complementary to A because this is the spot that's lit up. Same thing here. So this person may have a C uh, instead of a G or uh, an A or a T in that particular piece of their genome. This person, uh, you know, may have a, a G and that would be lit up. And then, you know, you you have two strands of DNA, so you might have one parent may have given you. Uh, let's just say this is A G C T. That's easy enough. So let's just say one parent gave you a G and the other person gave you a T at that particular spot. So you'd be heterozygous there. And so that's what that means. So we have all of these chips and, you know, I already pulled this video up. So you can take a look at how this works. And then and you can see like how the vocabulary that you learned from this class uh, will help you understand what this video says. I restarted it. Thank you. 
Okay, so that's basically how the chemistry works. It's just basically detecting um, fluorescent signals on the end of those probes of DNA that are affixed to that chip. So SNPs can give you a lot of info, useful information, but it's not going to tell you areas that aren't commonly polymorphisms in the human genome. So, for example, let's say it's not common to have a mutation that creates some disease uh, at a certain loci. So, you are you would never know that by doing an Illumina chip. Illumina chip is just going to tell you areas that vary are variable in the genome of different human beings. In order to get the best information, you're going to need to sequence that DNA. And in order to sequence DNA, you... There are two ways to do this. Um, the most common way, the only one I'm going to really teach you about because the, we don't really use the, any of the other ones, uh, is using a sang what we call the Sanger uh, dideoxy method. So the way that this works is you have a DNA sequence. So I'm just going to say that this is the sequence. Uh, Remember, there's a complementary sequence, so I'm just going to make up, you know, one of the strands, and we'll just say it's T A C G C T A A G A C T, and then this would be the five prime end. And just to remind everyone, there's a phosphate there and a hydroxyl here. So, uh, and if we're gonna, um, this works just like a PCR reaction. So we're going to need a, a primer. Normally we use the same primer that we would for the PCR product because that's usually how we're doing the sequencing. But we would order this primer up. And let's say that we would, if this is the T, we'd order an A. If that's three prime, we'd order a five prime. And this would be T, and this would be G, and this would be C, and G, and so on. And then rem let's remind everyone there's a hydroxyl group. So we know that the synthesis of the polymerase is going to be from the five to three direction. So from left to right, and let's just say that the polymerase binds, and it's going to add new nucleotides. So if it sees a T here, it's going to add an, an A. This is very close to red. Let me try yellow. What was I going to show? It? Let's do blue. So this would be an A because that's a T, and then we have an A here, so that's a T on this strand, a T, a, a G, a C, a G, a T, a G, an A, and so on. So this is how sequencing works. Okay, so in the reaction mix, and... I don't know if you remember this or not, but we just went over it. So in a PCR tube, there's some things that we need. We need magnesium. That's the cofactor. And we also need a primer. In, in pre-CR, we need two primers. But in sequencing, we only need one. So let me just say PCR, we need two. For sequencing, we need one primer. And it's very important we only use one primer. Uh, we also need a template, so a piece of DNA that we're going to replicate. We need uh, a buffer, right, It's because uh, pHs can change, especially with these reactions that are, that are uh, adding hydrogens into a solution uh, or taking them out. So pH definitely would change because that's how, what pH means, power of hydrogen. And when we link these molecules together, we are doing dehydration. So we're taking uh, hydrogens out, right? And what did that what would that do to the pH? If we remove hydrogens from a solution, then it makes the pH number go up, right? There's less hydrogens in the solution. And if we added hydrogens, the pH would go down, right? There would be more hydrogens, ions in the solution, protons. So we have to worry about a buffer because we're jacking around with the ratio of H pluses in a solution simply by the polymerase reactions, which speaking of, we need the polymerase, right? That's going to do 
the reaction. Any polymerase will do, but we want a thermal stable. So we're going to use the Thermos Aquaticus one. Pretty straightforward. And so we're going to mix all these things in a tube, right? Um, and in a normal PCR, we would need the deoxy uh, nu uh, nucleotide triphosphates. This D means it's deoxy, so it's not RNA, it's DNA. And then N stands for any nucleotide, A, G, C, and T, and equal ratios. But for sequencing, we need a special nucleotide. So we're going we're gonna to make this mix up just like this, but we're also going to add about a 10% ratio of, you know, we might want to go lower and you can play with this, maybe a 1% ratio, but somewhere between 10 and 1% ratio of DDNTPs. And that stands for dideoxynucleotide triphosphate. Well, what does that mean? Well, Here's DNA, right? RNA is an OH group here, so that's RNA. It's deoxy, that's where DNA comes from, because this oxygen here is missing. So this is DNA. And if we have dideoxy, it's going to be missing one, two oxygens, right? And because it's missing those, what do you think the polymerase cannot do? We only have a hydrogen. So remember we talked about the dehydration reaction to link molecules together. So in order to do that, we have to do we have to deal with water and what's water's formula? H2O. So if I take out oxygen, what am I going to get? I certainly can't do a dehydration reaction. So it it has to have that free 3 prime OH group here. If it doesn't have that, if it only has an H, the synthesis terminates right so <clears throat> let's say that I I um, well I'm just gonna say how we do it now they used to use radioactive materials to to figure this out but um, they don't really do that anymore okay so I'm just gonna use this marker okay so let's say that that we have we have our our primer and it's right here we're not gonna I'm not gonna even write the sequence out because it's always gonna be the same and then let's say that there's a T here right well so some of the time when we go to put a T in here um, that's gonna be fluorescently labeled a fluorescently labeled T and it's only the DNTPs that all of these are going to have a tag on them on the end and that tag may be yellow uh, it may be blue it may be red or it may be green since yellow is hard to see a computer converts that to black but anyway so let's just I'm just gonna I don't know exactly what this is but let's just say that's T and this is A and this is G and this is C so if we have a T in here and it ha only has a hydroxyl group in there, it's going to terminate. And so this is only going to be one, two, three, four, five, six nucleotides long. And it's going to have a yellow tag on it. Now, sometimes, you know, only 10% of the time we're going to get the T and terminate this. The rest of the time we're going to get a normal T. Right? We, we decided to use blue here. So the rest of the time we get a normal T in here with, from this pool, where, where is my here from this pool here these DNTPs are completely normal they're not fluorescently labeled so every once in a while 90% of the time we're gonna get a normal one that has the hydroxyl group and it's gonna go to the next letter which is in this case a is blue so I picked a bad color but let's just say that that's perfectly normal it's a normal a that's gonna get incorporated no let's not do that let's say that there's a, a bat a, a blue a Sorry, I used the blue for this, but this is the A. And so this in this case, this one's going to be uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 nucleotides. So this is 6 nucleotides, 7 nucleotides. And this is going to have a blue tag on it. And then the next one is going to have a red tag, right? 10% of the time it's going to terminate. Wait, A, T matches with A, so... 
This one would be an A, so we get another blue tag. That's going to be eight nucleotides long, and so it would terminate here and so on. And then when we put it in a gel, all right, so here's our gel, and I'm just going to put one well. Let's just say we put all the nucleotides in here. You guys know that the shorter fragments, sh the shorter fragments go further than the longer ones. So let's just say that this is a fragment down here. The first fragment to go through is going to be yellow. Dang it. <laughs> the first fragment to go through is yellow. And then the next fragment is going to be blue because it's an A. All right. This one is one nucleotide longer. The next one is going to be blue because it's an A. The next nucleotide in here is going to be um, so AA we a C what color C we made C green so that's going to be this uh, C right here is going to be green so that's going to be nine nucleotides so that's going to be here and then the next one after that so we have C is green it would be G which is going to be red So that would be red, All right? And we just keep going till we get to the end of the thing. So let, I'll, I'll just keep doing this. So this one is a C, this one's a G, so that's red. Again, we have another C, so that we made C's green. So we'll have a green band. And then the next one, uh, G, C, G is gonna be red, right? So the next one would be red, G, C, G. and then the next one would be an A would be incorporated in here, and we made A's blue. So you get a blue there, and then the next one would be uh, C pairs with G. Actually, I think I'm doing a something compliment, but it doesn't matter. So anyway, so when we read the sequence, we read it from the bottom up. So, you know, and I just go by color. So I can tell you that this sequence is T because that's yellow. And then the blue one is A and this one is A. And then the green one is C. The red one is G. The next green one is C. The next red one is G, and then the next blue one is A. So the sequence would be T A A C G C G A, just like we have it here. Come on, where are you, Marker? I can't see. I don't know why I can't see the the hover on that blue on the screen. But anyway, so we have our T right A A. C, G, uh, C, G, C, C, G, C, and then G, A. I think I messed up here, but anyway, that's the sequence, and that's how it's read. I'm having a hard time seeing these colors on the screen. I think I need to turn on the brightness. That's better. Okay. So that's how Sanger sequencing works. And I think, I'm pretty sure I have a video of how this works, but here's another thing. This is showing you with radioactive materials. So if we're using radioactivity, which we rarely do, then instead of having different colors and doing all one reaction, we would have like different nucleotides with a, say a P32 radioactive material attached to it. And so we would have to do a G as a separate reaction from C because there's no diff color difference, right? So we mix them all together. We're still going to get this radioactive background. Um, and then we'd have to do an A reaction. So that would be uh, phosphorus 32 attached to that. And then we'd have to do a T as a separate reaction too. So this is super old school. Um, I don't know why you need to do this like with the chemistry we have now, but... If, if when I was in grad school, 
uh, we had the first automated DNA sequencer at East Carolina. Um, one of the professors there wrote a grant to get it. And so before, before that automated sequencer, this is how it was done. All right. So, and, and this was, you know, in 1992. So not too terribly long ago, 20 something years, wait, 30 years, 30 years ago, uh, you had to use radiation. Now there's safer ways to do this. Anyway, so we have each of these nucleotides. Uh, these are the regular nucleotides. These are di dideoxynucleotides. And remember, occasionally they're going to get incorporated. So let's say here's the sequence. And we're incorporating the radioactive nucleotides here. So each one of these is going to get truncated. Uh, depending on if it's incorporating a regular nucleotide or a dideoxynucleotide. And so the first the first letter is C. Of course, this is the sequence that it's getting built off of, which would be G. And so we have C here, uh, which would be, we would load it into this gel. Um, and then we would have So we have our primer here, uh, which in this case would be like CAG. Remember, because we need <clears throat> we need a double strand and we need a three free three prime hydroxyl group for the polymerase to bind onto this and start reading the nucleotide. So it's not going to be able to incorporate anything here because this is where it's going to start. This would be position one, right, for sequencing, and this would be two. And this would be three and so on. So what's going on here is that every once in a while it's going to incorporate a T into this, right? And then that T is going to be a dideoxy, so it's only going to have an H, not a hydroxyl on it, right here. And so that chain will terminate. So the first piece, the first fragment we're going to get is going to have the primer already incorporated in it, and then we'll get that dideoxy radioactive and it's going to be radioactive so it'll have p32 attached to it i'll just put a little dot here to say that it's got radiation on it and so that fragment would move uh at the <coughs> excuse me let me erase this real quick that fragment since it's the smallest would move come on i'm not going to erase there we go that fragment of this T would move the furthest down the gel because it's the, f the longest fragment. And then the net, and so every once in a while we would get a regular T and that would allow the chain to continue and we'd get an A put in here. And then every once in a while that A would be terminated. So in the A lane, we would expect the next shortest fragment, which would be five. This doesn't count. This doesn't count as part of the primer. Uh, CAG. This doesn't count. It's also part of the primer. I don't know why they put that on there because that was confusing me. I'm just going to cross it out. So then the, the next longest one would be five nucleotides, including the primer. This is the primer, right? And so that would that would come up in an A because it would be radio labeled. And then the next one would we would have a T. Of course, the T would be in the T lane here. And then uh, we'd have a C match here, so that would be in the C lane, which would be right in, above that. And then we'd have another C again here. And then after C, we'd have an A, which would be here, because right, that would be the next longer one. And then we'd have a C. Uh, remember, occasionally this is going to terminate, but 90% of the time it'll go all the way through. And so we have a C, which would show up here as the next biggest one. Then the next letter would be T which would show up here, and then the last letter uh, would be uh, G, would be incorporated because it complementary to C. And so we would have the sequence, um, which we would read from the bottom up, and that sequence is T, A, T, C, C, A, C, T, G, which we just synthesized. It's right here. However, that's not the sequence of our original strand, so we have to complement that. So 
it's running anti-parallel, right? If this one, this one has to be five to three. So in order to get it written five to three, we have to reverse and complement it. So reversing that would start over here. So we would have C, A, G, T, G, G, A, T, A. And that would give us our sequence. C, A, G, T, G, G, A, T, A. Just like that. And so that's how you read an old school uh, radiographic uh, sequence. Let me see if I can find an image of one of these. So I guess this is so, so old that I couldn't really find on Google a good radiography for DNA. But here's one for RNA. And this is essentially what it looks like. So, again, you would, you know, just match the corresponding letters. That's an A. This is a U and so on. And you read the sequence. And then you'd have to reverse complement that sequence to get the actual original sequence. So we don't do that really anymore. Um, but you might get stuck on a deserted island and have to do it. And so I guess I'll teach you how to do it that way. So what we normally do is what we call automated DNA sequencing. So automated DNA sequencing works the same way. And I showed you that we just have different color labels for the dideoxy nucleotides. So when they get incorporated on the end, we can just look at a gel and tell what color it is. And like I, I said, that, so there's a laser that scans back and forth at the bottom of the gel. So let's say that this is our gel. And these are our pieces that are going to go through. So we know that this is going to go through first. It's the shortest and so on and so forth. So what we expect to go through first would be pink. Right. So the laser would detect. Do I have pink? This is kind of pink. So pink, that looks like just like red. <laughs> uh, shoot. Let's just do purple. Okay, so let's say pink is purple. This is actually purple. This is actually purple. This one will be purple too. So we have purple, purple. Then we have red. Then the next one that goes through is going to be blue. Dang it. I have a hard time seeing the blue in here. Then green. All right, and then red. And then we have green. And then we have our purple. And then we have blue. So this is how the fragments would look in a gel. And as they go through, right, they're going to go to the positive end. This is the worst color for me to see on this screen. So they're going to run to the po positive end. DNA is negatively charged, right? So it's going to run to the positive end. And as they go, the laser is going to read this. And it's going to give us a peak, right? So the peak should be purple. I'm not going to change colors for this. Purple, purple, uh red, blue, and so that's what this is. This is called an electropharogram or a chromatograph. And basically it's just reading the intensity of the lasers from the fluorescent dyes that are on the end of each of these pieces of DNA, right? And those correspond to letters of the of the sequence. And so you can, once the laser has detected this, and this is showing it going through a capillary gel instead of an actual full slab gel. These are actually easier to manage and easier to pour than those big gels. So anyway, and we just do the same thing. So the, the machine automatically reverse complements the sequence and you get your sequence. What are you doing? Well, I'm just, I'll cut and paste this.
you're going to need your temp, just like we talked about. So we, for sequencing, we'll need our polymerase, our primer, our template, our nucleotides, right? Um, and for Sanger sequencing to work, if we we're going to do PCR, this would be great. But for Sanger sequencing to work, we have to have dideoxynucleotides, right? These. Um, and so they're going to terminate this sequence. We, we can all we can do the reaction all in one too because the the gel can to tell the laser can tell green and blue and red and yellow apart if we were doing radiation we would have to do it in four separate tubes so we heat it up the strands separate just like PCR um, and then we're going to cool it down and a primer will anneal to it. Um, I guess this one is going backwards because it's so that the right side must be the the three prime. So we heat it up to whatever the optimal temperature is for the enzyme. Generally that 72. I don't know what particular enzyme this is. Maybe it's vent or something. But it's not TAC because TAC's optimal temperature is 72. And it's going to incorporate. So the, the regular nucleotides are the ones that aren't the terminators. But it just out of this pool, bam. So that A that's incorporated is a terminator. It doesn't have a hydroxyl group on it. So it can extend it. And so that length of DNA is terminated. That's why we call it a Sanger chain termination. It cannot add any more nucleotides. It does not ha have the ability to do a dehydration reaction. And so as we do this, we're going to get lots and lots of different strands in the reaction mix. And so we put that in a polyacrylamide gel. And the, so this is different than an agarose gel because polyacrylamide, the, the forest, and I told you this, is thicker and polyacrylamide than agarose and so we can get higher resolution of sequences from that than we can from agarose and this is a really old school machine so but this is kind of it works the same way except they use generally use capillaries now so this is basically what I was drawing on there And so here's the laser moving back and forth. Here's our sequence. And the laser will excite and tell us what color it is. And then it will give out those peaks so that we know what the sequence of DNA is. All right. These signals are not as strong as, say, these Cs, uh, for example. That could be for, from anything. And if there's any dirt or any background on that or anything that autofluoresces, that can wreck your sequence, too. So this has to be done in pretty sterile environments. Then we get the electropharogram, which we talked about. And then we the computer will reverse complement that to give us the exact sequence of those fragments so that we can know without a doubt what the sequence of the original DNA is. And those are the sequences that are published in PubMed. Remember, we always publish it in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, and we always publish the coding strand, which is not the template strand, right? The coding strand is the one that matches the code for the RNA. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. There's another one here. I'm going to let you guys look at it on your own. Um, we So Sanger sequencing was used for a first human genome, which was completed in 2003. Um, It cost $2.7 billion uh, to sequence one person's genome. Um, and it took uh, hundreds of scientists about 13 years to do that. So 3.15 billion nucleotides is our whole genome. Roughly $3 billion is the cost of that. So for a typical human person, you wouldn't have $3 billion lying around, so you wouldn't be able to sequence your own genome. Um, 
and so that's what we're, we're talking about here the cost in 2003 but we there are other sequencers that have come along so here's an Illumina sequencer analyzer and some other ones and we're going to talk about this and so it has driven the cost down and, and so in fact if you go to sequence I'm not sure if it's sequencing or sequence. Let me just look at it. So it is sequencing.com. And so if you go to sequencing.com, 85% off, pretty good. Uh, so you can sequence your entire genome. Um, and the cost, let's see if I can find that. Um, So roughly five hundred dollars, um, you can get the whole your whole genome sequence, and so they char their trick is that they charge you for all these different reports individually, but you can find those reports, and I'll show you how to do that later on in the class, um, for roughly five dollars. There's a sequencing software called Prometheus. I think it's still around. So you can take your DNA data and you can enter it into Prometheus. For, so 23andMe, Ancestry, Family Tree, Genos, any of these. Uh, and you can watch the YouTube video on it. But basically, it's going to search the database for all known diseased alleles, genetic trees, percent Neanderthal, UR, all the other things that that um, they're going to charge you individually for this, but but you do get your data. So I have my entire genome sequenced. I paid four hundred dollars for every single sequence. If I would have done that in two thousand and three, that would have cost me three, roughly three billion dollars, and no one would be able to do that. So the cool thing is, is that these days almost everyone can afford. If you can afford a cell phone, you can afford to sequence your whole genome. And that gives you a wealth of data. And, and because we can do something called personalized medicine, and personalized medicine um, is basically tailoring medications to individuals that have variations in the population, polymorphisms. We know that there's a million polymorphisms. So here's an example so of personalized medicine. And it's kind of interesting that medical schools are just now requiring doctors to take genetics. But before that, they didn't know anything about this. So uh, there are genes called cytochrome P450s that are in your liver, and they break down drugs. And so you probably had friends that say, some drugs work on me and some drugs don't or whatever. And I'm sure that you've heard about, like, so antidepressants. are also affected by cytochrome P450, as most medications are. Nexium, Prilosec, which are just like um, proton pump inhibitors, uh, those are affected by cytochrome P450, and most medications are. So p some people have more active cytochrome P450, which breaks down these drugs faster. And so if they break down the drug faster, you're going to need more of the drug than the average person in the population. And if they break down the drug slower, you're going to need less of the drug. And with this uh, genome, your whole genome sequence, you can tell how fast your cytochrome P450 enzymes are going to break down drugs and if you need more or less. So let's say, you know, generally in Asians, uh, let's just say Prozac, for example. So you know there's Prozac and Zoloft and a bunch of other antidepressants. And so when you go to the doctor's office and you say, I'm depressed, they might prescribe you this. And you have to wait like 30 days before it to actually work. Maybe it doesn't work, right? So what do they do? They put you on a different one. And then you wait 30 days. And then that doesn't work, they put you on a different one, right? But with your genome, they would already know before any of this nonsense exactly what drug worked on you. And 
Not only that, maybe your body breaks it down 10% faster than the average person. So you getting a standard dose, I don't know what the dose is, but let's just say it's 10 milligrams, you should get 11 milligrams because that's 10% more than a, a, per, a normal people. And maybe there's someone that, that, that breaks it down 20% slower. So you would want to get two milligrams less. So that would give you eight milligrams. And the pharmaceutical industry doesn't work this way, right? Usually it's like 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 50 milligrams. And they choose. They choose based on what's most common in the population. But we know there's lots of polymorphisms in the population. And so what personalized medicine is, is that if you have your genomic data, you can know what drugs are effective and how long they're going to last and how much of each drug you need to take. So when you go to the pharmacist, you're not they're not just giving you whatever pills they came in a bottle. They're actually manufacturing or making the pills in the pharmacy specifically tailored for you to work best for you and nobody else. And without the genetic data, you wouldn't be able to do that. So how are we able to do that? Well, these are some older sequencers. You know, this is this is probably the first capillary sequencer that was ever made. That's even older than that video I showed you. This is fifteen million dollars in two thousand and four. Um, Illumina. Uh, so f the machine isn't fifteen million dollars. The machine is about. Let's see. What do we pay for ours? Uh, I think it's about five hundred thousand dollars. But to sequence a whole genome would be $15 million in 2004. So 2003, before, so 2000 to 2000, let's say 1995, to, that's basically the earliest that they had this technology. 2003, 3 billion, right? So we got it down to 15 million. In 2011, Illumina uses a different technology that, which allows it to go down to 10,000 for a whole genome. And so in 2014, there's a thing called HiSeq. Um, we're pr trying to get one at Mesa Community College, and there's it's definitely some of it at ASU. And so HiSeq promises that we could get it to a thousand a genome. That's not really realistic because the reagents are a little more expensive. But you know, 2,500 bucks a. Um, and so you know, the thousand dollar promise of the thousand dollar genome is a big deal, right? If you we're looking at variations in this. So going from, you know, $200,000 in 2009 to $1,000 in uh, 2014 is like your pay going from uh, decreasing uh, $637 a week. Uh, night out, would $100 then. Now that would be $0.50. Cents. A new home would be uh, $1,300. Uh, your wedding might cost $140, a computer might cost $5, and so on. So this is a massive, massive change in price over a very short period of time. Okay, so how does Illumina do this so cheaply? And they do it by doing something called massively parallel sequencing. So we have DNAs that's fragmented via sonication. We use sonar waves to break up the DNA. They have these A overhangs that are added to the ends of the targets. The, the T's overhang those ends. They're, uh, they're ligated together. And our, here's our friend enzyme, our enzyme ligase, which you know and love. Um, and then we have adapters through the gels. They act as primers. And then they use PCR, right? So the, they have these specific sequences that are added to the end in this flow cell a dna library is washed across so the library would be like all of the sequence uh that was created from sonicating your dna if you sent this off to them it does something called bridge amplification and i'll show you a video of that and then then we have we add primers to those reactions and in the end uh it's going to be able to look at those and it's going to tell you what sequences on each of the targets right so the we add the nucleotides one at a time they're fluorescently labeled right it also has a blocker on the three prime end so until they cut the blocker off no extra nucleotides can be added um, so each nucleotide has its own color just like we talked about the once the correct nucleotide is in place 
um, the the fluorescent dye is cut off, the blockers release so that we get the next nucleotide incorporated, and then there's an optical detector that reads this, just kind of like the Sanger automated sequencer, but this is done uh, by looking at lots of spots at the same time. So in the old school method that we talked about, this one, um, we can only read one letter at a time, right? One, we're only going to, I mean, maybe there's like a hundred wells on here, but there's only so much space. And what makes this cool is that we can actually look at a whole ton of reactions. So I'm not, I'm not going to ask you anything about this. You don't need to know about this. Um, but I just, I wanted to present this because I didn't want you, I wanted you to see that all the junk that you've learned so far is really used today to advanced medicine um, and if we didn't understand how polymerases worked and, and how chain termination worked and all this other stuff and how sequencing worked, we would not have nearly as much information we do about human diseases and other diseases and genetic mutations that we do now. So we're, it's just going to, I'm just going to shoot this video real quick. This is going to explain it a lot better than I can on a flat screen. Chain. Okay, so I just wanted to say that what they're doing is the the fluorescent, the detector that's detecting fluorescence isn't able to detect that because there would only be one single letter incorporated, so they have to amplify the DNA so that they get lots of fluorescence so that the detector can detect that uh, color change, right? Whether it's a yellow or green or whatever it might be. So that's the first part is you're amplifying the DNA so that you can, so you get lots of copies of it. And then when you do the sequencing, you're going to get a very bright color change at that specific spot. <clears throat>
So it's not really proprietary. What they're doing is they're flooding it with all, like they're putting the flow cell in. I mean, maybe it's proprietary, but it's not that special. Um, so let's just back up a little. So the, they're putting all the T's in, right? And only spaces where T's are, are going to incorporate a T in there. And I, I'm just going to go back because <clears throat> I can't remember what color T is for them. So let's just go over this. So they put all these T's in here and every spot of the millions of spots that are on there is only going to incorporate T. So T, it's going to, it's the detector is like going to look at this whole cell and it's going to look at like maybe a thousand spots that are going to glow red at that second. And it's going to call that as a T. And then they're going to cleave off that fluorescent dye. Because if they left it on, it would still fluoresce red. So they cut it off. And there's a inhibitor that prevents it from going in there too. So they treat that. And then next they're going to put in, say, A's. You know, certain places are going to get A's. This is not. And then they'll put in a G and then a C. And it's not until they go through it again that they add a T. It's going to bind there. And so you're going to get, you're going to get each of these colors fluorescing at each of these spots all at the same time. And it, the machine is going to read all these spots. So you're basically seek doing a million sequencing reactions all simultaneously. So, so they they have bioinformatics software that allows you to read their the proprietary sequencing method, which is fine. So Helicos does the same thing. I'm not going to go through the whole process because it doesn't really matter. Um, but Helicos can actually their detector is sensitive enough that that it can actually see one. Uh, so it's not using color, it's using a, a, a fluorescent image, but it knows what letter has been put in. So instead of reading different colors, it's just reading, is it lit up or not? And so I'll show you real quick the, where are we here? Yeah. So this is how Helicos works. And again, this is just mass, mass, no, I don't want my old, thank you, massively paralleled sequencing. That's with sonication. So the, what they've done is they've created a uh, poly A's just like on the RNA. And so they, they, instead of having to build a bunch of sequences on a particular site, they're just capturing the pieces of DNA that have added poly A tails on them. Probably with a polyadenylase, of course, they're not going to tell me because it's proprietary. And then on the DNA chip itself, they have T's, which are obviously going to be complementary to A's. And so that's how they fix these uh, pieces of DNA into the, their, what they call for the system. Self-service. Okay. 
server to eliminate the surface of the flow scene, the new location of each recently labeled template. The CCD camera produces a map of the templates on the flow cell surface. So I hope that this you can hear what's on the screen. If not, you might have to play the videos. I was trying to look to see if that setting was on. But anyway, so we have a T, and this poly T is going to serve as the primer, right? So all we need is a double-stranded and then a free three-prime hydroxylant. So this is the three-prime OH right here on this end. And so it's just it's just stepwise building the sequence on lots of those different locations. All right. So that's Helicos. Ion Torrent does this. It's kind of cool the way they do it. It uses changes in pH. So when you cleave off that phosphate group and do the hydrolysis reaction, hydrogens uh, or sorry, dehydration reaction hydrogen is released and we know from you know ho hopefully 181 that when we add hydrogens to a solution it changes the ph which we talked about and so this it's basically working by reading changes in ph and it knows that if it puts a, a bunch of t's in there and there's no change of ph then a t isn't incorporated if if there is a change of pH, we get a little peak, a variation, and it knows that T was incorporated. And then we put the other nucleotides in. And so when we get changes of pH, we know that that nucleotide has been incorporated. And if we have two T's in a row, we're going to get twice the pH change. Uh, and so this is a little faster. Uh, I know ASU has an ion torrent there. I'm not going to go through the, the whole thing. You guys can watch it if you want. Pacific Bioscience is, is similar. It's kind of cool the way they do it. They actually have like a like a Z, like a a polymerase bound into a little cell, and it, this laser is so sensitive it can detect a single color change at one site. And so it it just works a little differently. And if you want, you can look at the way that that sequence uh, works as well. And so <clears throat> this is the video for uh, Pacific Biosciences. And there's some other companies that are doing it. So, you know, the goal is to get a $100 genome, right? We're pretty close. Like, like I said, I just paid $500 to get my whole genome sequence. But we want it to be affordable for everyone so that we can do personalized medicine. And that's the goal. And also know... Uh, whatever diseases are caused, we can figure out what the mutations are by sequencing the DNA. And not only for humans, but, you know, for cats or whatever. And this is what's great about having the human genome is we know all the sequences. We know all the letters. We can make primers for any loci that we want uh, as long as we have the entire genome already sequenced. So even though we spent $3 billion to sequence the genome, Without that data, we wouldn't be able to do all this stuff because we wouldn't have the primers that we needed to make the amplifications to look at the the genome completely. So it's super cool. You know, this is um, 
cutting edge technology and and it's going to change the future I'm, i guarantee you that personalized medicine is coming and it's going to come fast i think the the rate limiting step right now is that physicians and pas and stuff like that they don't really know genetics so they don't understand this data but one day they will and pharmacists will and then you'll go to your doctor and they'll be able to prescribe and they'll ask you for your dna sequence they'll look at it and they'll be able to prescribe you the exact medication that works best for you uh, has the least side effects and they'll be able to prescribe exactly how much of it you need and you won't be like a human experiment a human guinea pig where they're just trying different drugs in different doses to see what will work because they'll already know based on your genome so anyway i think that's pretty cool um and and that's sort of the future that we're looking at so as far as the test i'm not going to ask you anything about uh, next generation sequencing except for the fact that it's massively parallel which means that we're looking at lots of sequences at the same time and that's what drives the cost down so i'm not going to ask you anything specific about any of the ways that this is done but you do need to know how sanger works and you do need to be able to read a gel or an electropharogram so I might throw one of those on the quiz or the test or whatever. So uh, make sure you know how to do that. It's super simple. As long as you know that the smaller fragments are going to go further in the gel uh, and that it's, you know, you're just reverse complementing the sequence. You should be able to do that. No problem. All right. So um, I'm going to make a quiz for this. I'm going to post it on Canvas. Uh, it's going to cover lectures 10, 11, 12. Uh, and then this one which is 12b and then I'll finish the problem set and I'll post that on canvas as well and so uh, and then remember spring breaks coming up so uh, this is a spring lecture so if I reuse this videos for fall uh, there isn't a spring break but <laughs> this semester is spring 2024 and there will be a spring break so anyway uh, just a reminder, and that's all I got. If you have any questions, come to office hours, send me an email.